a great my my screen froze am i in the middle of the camera you froze and it's not a very flattering picture no no i look like i'm been drinking here at work <laughs> is it frozen, frozen for everybody yeah I, I you're frozen for me i can hear what your what audio what do i do about that <laughs> I don't know how to fix this. Yeah. We were doing fine. How did you start? I managed to, I was turning off my Facebook. Should I stop and, should I stop and restart? Try, <laughs> try, try, um, try turning off your video and turning it back on. <coughs> yeah, Ron is saying it's frozen. Okay, there you yeah, go. There you go. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Get the embarrassing stuff out of the way first. And that way, anything that happens after that is not a big deal. I've had some of the most embarrassing things happen to me in my life that I don't think there's anything that could happen to me now that would be, that would bother me to be, to be honest with you. So that must be liberating. <laughs> it actually is very liberating. I think the time I walked out of the bathroom stall with toilet stuck to my shoe, that was pretty embarrassing. I, I went to a Denver Nuggets game with a friend of mine, and um, I would, might have had a couple of beers. And I walk into the, they have these big open bathrooms. And I walk into the bathroom, and I, I looked down, I'm like, something's wrong here. And this woman looked at me, and she says, wrong one, buddy. <laughs> and I thought that was perfectly polite under the circumstances. I just, I'm sorry, and I walked out. I just had too much to drink. I had a, I had a... I guess the most embarrassing thing I've ever done that was a public thing was the very, very, very first time I spoke about girl of skepticism. Well, the second time I ever spoke about girl of skepticism was a lecture I did in Berkeley or Oakland, oh, 10 years ago or something. They put me in this, I wasn't feeling really good. And they put me in this little tiny room. I didn't really know what I was going to say. I has, wasn't really prepared. It was back before I even had a name for the group. The room was just kind of dead with no air flowing through or anything i got up and i and the room was packed there was 50 people in this little tiny room i was like wow i thought like five people would show up and mark edward was in the very back of the room and i had other friends that were scattered in there and a lot of people i didn't know and they started i started on my little spiel that i hadn't really researched about why wikipedia is a really good idea to to, to be you know editing wikipedia and then all of a sudden I felt all the blood drain from my face. And I said, I am going to faint right here and standing in front of these people. And I said, I managed to get Mark is going to handle the next part. And Mark came walking up to the front and I ran out and I passed out. And then I got into the bathroom. My friend got me in the bathroom. And I was so sick. And then I, I got up, cleaned my face, washed my face, came back in and finished the lecture. So that was the, probably the worst, but Mark got right up and he's like, I don't know what he's talking about, but he just took over. So activism is really important because of these things. And it was just hilarious. Anyway, we're getting off subject. Hello, everyone out there in Facebook live land. I am so happy to have you here with me. Yes, I see some people already have joined us. And I am being joined here today with a very good friend of mine, Hamilton the Cat. <laughs> Craig Foster, who's a very good friend of mine. I'm going to tell you some uh, a really funny story in just a second. I wanted to uh, let everybody know on YouTube. Hello, YouTube people, because this will be put on YouTube later. Craig says hi to everybody. We're going to, uh, this is going to be a conversation with Craig Foster, who is who is a um, about to leave. In fact, we may find that somebody's interrupting him as we go because he's on his last day at work. And he'll tell you a little bit about it. So if anybody comes in and says, Craig, what are you doing here still? <laughs> Why is your office so empty? <laughs> He's got strategically things put in the back behind him. I see a sticker for Girl of Skepticism right behind him. But he showed me his room. Everything else is empty. <laughs> it's pretty funny. It's, it's really great. It's kind of sad, but new beginnings. So Craig, tell us who you are and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Craig Foster, and I am a social psychology professor, and I went to the University of North Carolina to get my PhD, and then I came here to the Air Force Academy, which is where I am right now on my very last day after 21 years. And then I will be leaving here to join the psychology department at 
a small public school called SUNY Portland that is about 40 minutes south of Syracuse. Uh, but I find it fitting that after 21 years of being at the Air Force Academy, my last day is filled with out-processing and skepticism. So uh, I had lunch this, or pardon me, I had a breakfast this morning with a friend of mine, Carlos. He's a philosopher. So he's in the philosophy department here. And he has a connection to PSYCON because he, I wish I could remember, he spoke to like Ray Hall's class or Ray Hall spoke to his class. But he knows Ray, and um, and I, so I'm glad to know Carlos. And then I'm talking to you, and then I'll be talking to Katie later about some of the stuff she's planning to do in her class. Oh wow, fantastic! I love I love Katie Katie Dyer and uh, Ray Hall. So there's going to be some name dropping in this. I'm just going to tell you guys that right away. Just saying, I'm sorry, but. Um, you know, I'm kind of reminiscing with Craig. I, I wanted to get a good call with him today, but we're going <laughs> to, I hope we're not going to catch up so much that people are going to be like, who, what, what? So we'll try. We'll try. Right, Craig? We'll try to. We will try. We'll try to kind of keep the names out so much, or if we do, we at least say something. But people who are missing um, conferences and events like SciCon will be able to say, oh, man, I remember that. Oh, I missed that, too. <laughs> It's been really kind of fun. So I want to tell you guys how Craig and I met. Um, and here's Stuart Weiss, I another friend, another great person, friend of mine. So, <laughs> so what happened is there's this magazine called Skeptical Inquire. And I have this project called the Grill Skepticism on Wikipedia Project. And one of the things that we do in this project is we not only write Wikipedia pages about science and scientific topics and people of science and pseudoscience topics and just make sure that the Wikipedia pages are real, in really great shape. But one project I have is called backwards editing. And it's kind of the opposite of how somebody would normally edit a Wikipedia page. Normally an editor would go to a Wikipedia page and say, I'd like to add something to this Wikipedia page. And then they go out and look for sources to put on that Wikipedia page to improve it. Well, this thing I, I, I don't know if I created or not, it's how I train, but it's probably done by other people, but I call it backwards editing. And that's where you take a source that is a reliable source, which is something that is, uh, has journalistic integrity, something that has uh, editorial oversight, like, you know, the New York Times, um, Washington Post, you know, uh, rely, they call they called reliable sources, not like the Daily Mail or Breitbart or something like that. So you start with a reliable source and then you can go through it and you find something that you say, oh, that's interesting. And then you go to the Wikipedia page and you say, I'm going to add this article to the Wikipedia page. So that's something that I make all my people in training do. And from time to time, we go through these magazines and we spend 15 minutes, 20 minutes trying to do backwards edits. And we have a project on our group that's uh, run by David Powell in Ohio, who uh, we're going through all the magazines, all the Skeptical Inquirer magazines. And we could do this with Skeptic Magazine or whatever, but we've decided to start with Skeptical Inquirer one by one and take an article out of it and put it onto a Wikipedia page. So, sorry, that was a little long. So I found that I was working on backwards edits and is this your magazine? This isn't yours. Oh, my cat's sleeping on yours. This is yours. <laughs> I was doing this last night. This is the one that was supposed to go back onto my shelf because I finished it last night. So <laughs> I was going through this skeptical inquire 2017, 16, May, June, 2016. And I found this article that I thought was really interesting. And I was reading it for the first time and I probably should have had it bookmarked, but it is right. You know, when you have cats and things sleeping on stuff, page 45, that's what it is. He was keeping it warm in the sunshine for me. Nice California sunshine. Ta -da! So I think this is the first article you wrote for Skeptical Inquirer? It is. Yep. Okay. Scientific Reasoning at the USAF Academy, United States Air Force Academy. An examination into titanium treated necklaces. And I thought, oh, this looks really good. So I read the article. And then I, when you're reading these articles, you're looking to see if you can find something in there that would be um, 
a way of summarizing the article and maybe two sentences, something like that. That's how you're trying to find a way of summating it. And I went through and I was able to, uh, oh man, this is a long article. Look at all these pictures in here. Yep. There's more. This is, you got, you got a pretty big article for somebody who's writing for the first time for Skeptical Inquirer. And then of course here you guys are with the other two. And there you are in your fancy, in your fancy oh, suit. Yeah, the, uh, the professional <laughs> civilian military photo. flag in the back. Woo. Mm -hmm. So what happened is, and you can tell me about this in a second, but what happened is, is I, um, I took the article, I took, condensed it down to two or three sentences, went to the Wikipedia page for the necklace, and I made a, a citation on it saying, here's what this Air Force Academy people did, and they put together a test, and, and the test showed that placebos were no better than, I mean, it was no better than a placebo or something like that. I summed it up. And then another thing I like to do is after I've made an edit like this, I like to contact the person I made the edit for, you know, whoever it is, and say, hey, by the way, we just used your article you wrote on a Wikipedia page. Because I think it's kind of fun, you know, it's like maybe, I don't know, I think it's great, you know, to be used on a Wikipedia page is a pretty big deal. So I wrote to Ken Frazier, who's the editor of Skeptical Inquirer magazine, who I think he gave me your email. And I wrote to you and I said, hey, check it out. I put your, your article onto a Wikipedia page. And you wrote back. And that was nice. You're like, thanks so much. That's really great. Thank you. And that was it. And then like a year later, so I'm sitting at a, um, I'm at a conference, PsyCon in Vegas. It's canceled this year, but you guys got to go next year. It's really great. So I'm sitting there and you come up to me and you said, hey, are you Susan Gerbic? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And you're like, hey, um, <laughs> you started telling me this story about how how I had contacted you and and it, you know of course it's coming back to me by then I'm trying to find the picture and um, I it was just great we had a great conversation I was dressed up as um, Medusa because that's what you do and <laughs> we sat and talked for a couple hours it was great I was like why is this guy not going into the lecture because he's just sitting here talking to me here we are <laughs> so I took this beautiful picture of the wall. Oh, we just happened to be in the corner of it here. But I was sitting there every day. I dressed up as twice a day. I changed my clothes to some new Halloween outfit. I figured, you know, it's time. It's time to be dressed up as Halloween costumes. And so it was fun. And so we've been great friends ever since. So Absolutely. that is my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Do you remember something different, Craig? No, that's the way I remember it. But you were so entertaining. Why would I go into one of the presentations? They were surely going to be less entertaining. You, you were new to skepticism, formal skepticism, In that was your first conference you attended. And yep. so I was kind of just filling them in on the background and it was fun, it was, it was great. I just hung out at my table. It's a little known fact that I go to all the conferences I possibly can, but I go to almost no lectures. I hang out in, outside and what happens is the speakers come and talk to me, you know, because they're like waiting for them to go on and they're just hanging out and they, they come out and sit with me and all these interesting people come over and just kind of hang out at the table. So I find that I'm having a better time, you know, hanging out at the conference than watching the lectures, which I can get on video. I wish I could just kind of do both, but you know, that's the way it is. Tell us about this, um, this, this first article and how you got into, I mean, how did you do this? I mean, the first foray pretty much into, into the skeptical world, you decided you're gonna do a test and, and use your students and then write to a Skeptical Inquirer magazine? How did that work? <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. So um, I had a statistics and research methods class. I can't remember, it's a year long sequence. I can't remember if that was the statistics part or the research methods part. It was probably the statistics part because we were probably using the data to create uh, a lab experiment. So, I was trying to figure out some skepticism type test we could do in class. And what had happened, now I'm going back even farther in time, what really started all this was when I taught statistics and research methods, I, I had a concern that when we're teaching that here at the Air Force Academy, and this is probably true in most departments, most of our students don't go on and become psychology professors. They go on and they do something in the real world. In our case, most of them go, they almost all go on and become officers in the Air Force. So 
I spent a lot of time reflecting, why do these students need statistics and research methods? And I don't think there's any disputing that they do because it's so central to what a psychologist or a behavioral scientist does. But it really, I came to realize they're going to use scientific reasoning way more than they're going to use the intricacies of statistical tests. We are recording so, the I, I wanted to put a greater emphasis on how people think scientifically in the way that, that a, uh, a seasoned psychologist would think about something. And so to do that, I wanted to come up with some type of experiment they could do in class so they could see it from start to finish and see the need to collect data to test any type of scientific claim, but particularly an outrageous scientific claim. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, we were kicking around different ideas and it was actually one of my co-authors, he said, have you thought about these bite necklaces? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh my gosh, all these baseball players are wearing these bite necklaces. It's like the big thing now. And I looked into it and sure enough, I mean, I take my kids to their hockey tournaments and there's big you know, podiums of titanium necklaces. And I thought, well, this is perfect because we can create a control condition. And so, yeah, there you are. Those are two of my students. And then you could the see here- They're wearing these big um, necklaces? Is that was yes. what they were wearing? And I'm pointing at them, which is of course stupid because all I'm doing is pointing at my computer <laughs> screen. Uh, but we're all friends case, here, Craig. Yeah, so one of those necklaces is a bite necklace and the other is the control condition that's a piece of clothes on. Uh, and it, it says in the article, it doesn't really elaborate on it, but I, I spent a lot of try, time trying to find a, um, a piece of uh, rope, if you will, that would match the bite necklace. I went to Michael's and I'm like squeezing yarn and, <laughs> and my kids are like, oh my God, I can't feel this yarn. And it, it's actually a piece of clothesline from Home Depot. Yep, so we taped them up and then, uh, and then I told the class what we were doing and I passed them out and <laughs> one student, he got a little scared. He's like, is, is this gonna hurt me? <laughs> Because they had to wear them for a couple of days. I was like, no, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, you know, don't worry. And of course, the product is supposed to do all these things pseudoscientific, pseudoscientific products do, right? Where they, they make you feel more relaxed and vital at the same time and, and all these tremendous claims. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how we, we went into doing this. And they didn't, know, they didn't know if they were wearing a real necklace or if they're wearing a fake necklace no. and did you and your co-authors know who was wearing no no so it's completely no. double blinded yes yeah so we passed them out in class and they were mixed up so they were random i mean if i looked at them if i picked them up and really looked closely i could figure it out but they're in a big pile and i'm just walking around the classroom passing them out so there was no way to know and then after uh two days so it would be one class period to another on the second day, they completed the post survey and there was no pretest. So they just all completed a post test. And then, which is better for their lab experiment anyway, because it's easier for them to do the pretest. So then they completed a survey and then they broke open their necklaces and they had to write down whether they were orange or white. Because the orange ones were the white necklaces and the white ones were the clothes on. And the results were? <clears throat> They're null results. They're not statistically significant. Now, for all of you statisticians out there, for the many, many people that are ready to take a statistics course, you don't prove an all, right? So you fail to get significance. So we did not find any evidence that these things work. But I mean, there's no sensible mechanism to explain why they work. I mean, it would be it would be a revolution in particle physics if these things work. It's just not sensible. And we had three dependent measures, and two were in the right direction, and one was in the wrong direction. I mean, there's just no evidence for anything. <laughs> So yeah, it, it didn't work. But before, before I leave this topic, a, a funny story that isn't in the article. Okay, this is good. Uh, okay, I'm ready. So, we are recording. Uh, no, <laughs> thank you for reminding me. This was pretty innocent. We, you know, there's more than one way to debunk something. And we wanted to do the, the test. It really shouldn't be needed, right? The burden of proof should be on the company. Absolutely. Like, you know, they make this claim. It's hard to disprove a claim. It's, it, it should be on them to demonstrate the claim. It's the same thing with the anti-vaccination, and that's a point I raised in my class. Like, look, it's hard statistically to prove something doesn't happen. But so you have to step back and go, no, you need to prove it does happen. You need to prove facilitated communication does work. But nevertheless, we can do the test and say, see, look, there's no results. Or if it, if it works, then we can, I guess, help 
revolutionized psychology, physics, and, and biomedicine all at the same time. But anyway, so one of the other ways to um, kind of appeal to people when, I guess, just the lack of a physical mechanism to explain this is to use other ways to address this. So I was learning, of all things, about titanium and being a psychologist. I'm, I'm not an expert on titanium, as you might imagine. So I start just learning about, well, what is this? Um, uh, what is this element, pardon me? And think, where does it come from? And blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out that titanium is really, really common. This is, this is the appeal of it because people might go, well, why is titanium expensive? Well, it's expensive because it's hard to manufacture, but the element itself is really common. Um, if, if I tried to state something about it, I'd be totally wrong and all the chemists could just shake their heads at me, so I won't do that. But it turns out titanium is really common. So we decided it would be fun to go see if there's titanium on a baseball field, because that would mean these people are wearing these necklaces to get the power of titanium while they're standing on a big like field of titanium. Oh, and I hadn't heard this. Okay. Yeah. The whole earth is basically like from a conceptual standpoint, it's like you're standing on a big ball of titanium. There's titanium like everywhere. So we figured there would be titanium in the baseball field because dirt just has some oxidized titanium in it. So we actually, uh, I contacted the Colorado Rockies because I thought it would be so cool to go to a major league stadium and like, we'll find out if there's titanium in the, on the field. And of course, not surprisingly, they never called back, but I had Oh a man, they missed their chance to be in Wikipedia. <laughs> they, they missed their chance to be at the forefront of science. Yeah, because yeah, it could have been, yeah. Yeah, get some publicity. But anyway, they didn't they didn't call back. So I had a friend who worked for the Sky Sox here in town with the AAA organization. Uh -huh. And they agreed that they would let us come out there and take samples from the field. So we go out there to take samples. And I I meet one of the people that was helping us. I will not say what position this person was in. And he was very helpful. I mean, I think he it, it, Anybody from the Sky Sox organization it would happen to listen in on this. This guy was great. Uh, he seemed like a great employee. I really, really liked him. But when we're out there and uh, we're, we're collecting the samples from the field and from the pitcher's mound. <clears throat> and he says, what are you doing? So we, we told him what we were doing. And he goes, oh, man, yeah. Whew, I got one of these on right here. <laughs> he says, oh, man, it's really been helping me with my chronic pain. <laughs> and, oh, my gosh. I was like, oh, this is, this is kind of awkward. awkward. But I, I wasn't, I didn't feel the occasion to challenge him on this, and he was doing us a favor, and we didn't have the results. So I just said, oh, well, if it, it's working for you. That, that's, that's great. And then we collected our samples and ran them through the spectrometer. And yeah, there's titanium all over the field, long and short of it. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. See, that was worth just talking to you just for that story. That's really good. I hadn't heard yeah, that. Pretty funny. Poor guy. You know, and so, so with this classroom and experimentation stuff, I was thinking, no, I'm not putting you on the spot to do something right now, but one of the things I've been thinking is that, you know, people are always talking to me about psychic, people who believe in psychics, and, you know, I'm, I'm really big on saying, you know, don't blame them. We don't, it's, it's not necessarily their fault. I think that in some cases they are probably being willfully ignorant when they could find the answers, but they don't. But it's not a really far step to believing in people communicating with the dead when you're raised into a, a, a faith system like a Christianity or whatever that believes in demons and, and life after death and all that. It's just a tiny little step. To, to believe in that somebody could contact the dead. So my, my thing is, is that I really don't think we teach really good critical thinking or really actually much of critical thinking, at least here in the United States. I was in my second or third year of college before I, had, I was required to take a critical thinking class. And that critical thinking class was not even really, um, we looked at advertisements and we looked at uh, some things, but in, you know, the logic like, you know, Q plus thing, whatever equals, that's not real life. I mean, I didn't feel like it applied to anything, but I think these real world examples 
are really what helps people through the process of thinking about things critically. The problem is, is that especially in high school, you know, when you're dealing with minors or younger, you can't use real world examples like anything that would have anything to do with religion. Um, I mean, even some topics on the medical things, that's kind of off the plate. Um, flat earth, creationism, you can't really discuss those especially with the minors without having to have, you know, oh, you're, you're infringing on my beliefs in your heart, you know, and the parents are going to come and get you and all these other things and they're going to do nasty reviews on you. But, but this test you did seems like it was kind of the perfect kind of thing they could use. I mean, you're talking about, it's not really harming necessarily anybody. It's not like a belief system. So it seems like what you did was something that's replicable in other classrooms, except now that you tell me this part about the guy that you ran into who was wearing one himself, and you're kind of messing with his, um, his belief system. But what do you think of that? I mean, I think that we should be teaching this younger, some sort of critical thinking stuff. Good question, Susan. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we, Need to be respectful of people's faith but um and obviously there are a lot of boundaries between that and education particularly education of minors where we um where we draw lines and uh, that's appropriate a lot of the times right like i don't really think there's a need to go in and attack people's religious principles i mean a lot of these are pretty broad and honestly they're outside of the domain of science mm -hmm. but it seems to me that we do cross that line when you talk about evolution and creationism i mean we teach evolution in high schools and i think that's appropriate so i'm not sure that distinction is i just don't think it's entirely clear i mean is this how we're going to live that if somebody says this is now a religious principle to me that we're going to exempt people from science education. It, it's, it's pretty tough. And, um, but nevertheless, we, it's some murky area that we continue to go around, right? Um, Anti-vaccination. I, I think we teach in high school that vaccination works. But if somebody turns that into a religious principle, or are they going to be exempted? So I, I just don't know where we draw that line. I do know that the flat earth, um, community, at least the one in the United States, has a lot of biblical inner ramptism to it or literalism to it. So uh, that's a point that I like to make, and I made it in Skeptical Inquirer that says, look, if you're going to endorse this principle that uh, a significant enough religious view can trump science, then why not the flat earth? Why not exempt, exempt students from the round earth in high school and <laughs> allow the flat earthers to have their uh, time globe earth theory mm -hmm. and I just I think it's a contradiction that people have because people that believe in creationism say well it's appropriate for creationism but then you say well what about the flat earth and they go well it's not appropriate for that and I, I don't understand that. but uh, to go this other direction I do think that just psychologically you you just have to be practical that people aren't ready for certain discussions. So you need to have a safe discussion and uh, a magic necklace that is supposed to, uh, little bits of titanium are supposed to help your tendons heal faster, even though you sleep above a big earth of titanium and nobody can explain how those bits affect anything physically um, is a good, a good place to start. Very good. What else were you asking in that question? I feel like I failed the question. No, no, you're fine. I'm trying to get the, uh, I'm, I, if I look off to the side, it's because I'm able to look at the conversation over here and there. Oh, please do. Uh, you never put me on the spot though. I thought you were setting me up for a- No, uh, no, I wasn't. I psychic, just, a psychic test in class. No, no, not at all. The one I <laughs> thought about- Google, They're so what? funny, these comments. I'm not even going to tell you what these people are saying because they're hilarious. These, they're, they're friends, people we know from other places. Sure. And they're making some interesting comments that you could read later, Craig. <laughs> okay. 
Are they about my hair or my shirt or the butt? Or the butt? <laughs> I'm not going to even tell you. You're going to laugh. They're, they're <laughs> they think they're so funny. So <laughs> They are funny. I just don't know whether they're being funny now. <laughs> so um, you've done a couple talks at PsychOn. Mm -hmm. Well, well, really, really interesting talks. You've done a Sunday paper and then you did a full talk at PsychOn. Yep last year 2019 or was that the year before I'm, I'm dates and times are just kind of blurred to me right now sure was it so 2019 was, yes the full talk was last year and then um then the sunday papers were previous to that yeah give give us an idea what it was you talked about and you can see at least the uh sunday paper on our youtube channel and i will try to put it up in our notes on when i put this on youtube tell us about uh the sunday paper first which is about sports. I thought it was great. Both of them were about sports. Yeah, no, the first icon, uh, I, uh, I did my paper about football and I, <laughs> it was about the pseudoscience that's coming with, uh, with football. I wish I, I hadn't packed everything up. I could grab the, the book off my shelf where it's this very angry book about like how these, you know, these, um, uh, wimpy people are unfairly trying to kill football and how instrumental football is to American culture and really hasn't happened yet because football is still still going strong but um, but yeah it was just about the pseudoscientific things people are going to say about football yeah you were predicting you're making a prediction right. for the future what's that you were making a prediction for the future yes I was, uh, that, was, that was the big point is pseudoscience by definition is when you study pseudoscience, it's almost by definition retroactive, right? Like mm -hmm. nobody's like, hey, let's talk about these fighting necklaces that are going to start, right? It, it, it pops up in different areas. And then we as skeptics go, oh my gosh, is this thing just totally ridiculous? And then when, when the community decides that it is, you're like, hey, look, everybody, this is ridiculous. Uh, and it's not just us, of course, it's also scientists. Right. But it's typically retroactive. And so with the football paper, what I wanted to do was at least get some uh, predictions out before it really grew. Now, of course, for this to happen, nobody's going to care until they start losing their high school football. And so here's another, thank you for this, because this is another way for me to document these predictions ahead of time. <laughs> but I mean, if it starts closing down, people are gonna go nuts. They're gonna, I mean, look, I love football and like, I don't wanna lose football, but let's be reasonable. I mean, should high school children be playing football? I, I think that's a fair question to ask. I'm mm -hmm. probably going to get hate mail just based on that because people love football so much. I'd probably be better off talking about atheism than, <laughs> than playing on football. Um, but look, and people just, they're going to say all these crazy things. I already hear some of them. And I mentioned that in the talk, like football's safer than it's ever been before. And I said in the talk, I'm like, well, juggling two chainsaws rather than three is safer. It doesn't mean it's right. Like, Let's just ask ourselves, like football or, or track. Um, mm -hmm. So I was talking about the the kind of uh, things that I think a pro football community will say in the future one day when they get so angry that football is being shut down. Right. And I, I think I think if it does happen, it's going to happen at the high school level, where where administrators just are going to say it's too expensive and we don't need to incur the risk. And there is some evidence of, of certain schools saying we're, we're not doing this anymore. But um, obviously football is still going, going strongly. And then I, the next one, I really love this talk. And I, uh, not, you know, all three of these, I haven't published on any of them, which just shows how behind I am on everything. Um, the, the next Sunday talk was, I, was, I can't remember where I had this epiphany, but I think I was in my car driving and I thought, you know, the, the thing with the claim that like God helps people with sports is it's like a lot of um, pseudoscience. It's not really pseudoscience because it's not about science, but same kind of feel. It's obviously paranormal. They, the thing with that claim is people usually just pick their spots, right? So when Tim Tebow succeeds, um, they go, oh, look, there it is. And then when he's... Um, uh, when he's no longer given a starting position in the league, right? It's like, uh, you know, God had a plan. So everything good is, is God helping and everything bad is God had a plan. I wrote about this, by the way, in Free Inquiry, if anybody ever wants to check it out. So, 
So, uh, you know, that's a horrible pun in the title, and I'm sorry. But, <laughs> yeah. but I thought, you know, what's interesting is if you look at the March Madness, the it's set up to test this theory because you have a whole season and then religiously based schools and uh, secular schools all go to a committee and they sort out who's going to play who based on how well they've done to that point. And you can quibble with how they do it, but more or less you would have to agree the number one seeds are better than the number 16 seed. And I thought, if God is really intervening in sports, wouldn't God take that moment to try to help some of the faith-based schools? Like, wouldn't God go, you know, let's see if we could just give who, um, like St. Joe, Joseph's, like, let's just give them a helping hand. You can, uh, so I, I said, I had a student that I thought would be interested in hilarious. To it, and he, and he was. And so all we did was collect NCAA data, and we coded whether they were, at the time, a religiously-based school or a secular school, and we just compared in the first round of the tournament who does better. And there's no evidence. Like, there's no evidence that faith-based teams do better. And so I, I don't I don't know. It's just, again, it's hard to prove an all. But you look at it, and you're like, well, there's no evidence God's helping here. And when we were doing this study, it was the year that um, – I can't remember, but some faith-based school did really, really well, and they had a non-sister or something that uh, somebody's going to know. Somebody's going to type it in there, Loyola or something. They did really well. Loyola, Chicago, maybe. Uh, and, of course, this was a big news story, and then they lost, and uh, nobody wrote an article saying, like, I guess God doesn't like the nun anymore. Or, God liked the team well enough to get them to the final four, but then God just you got distracted yeah i got distracted <laughs> and um but i you know uh, with the with the um supernatural and sports thing i really like it because it, it's safe right like it, i don't i make a point and i think some skeptics might say i'm too timid and they might be right about that i don't know about that no yeah I, I don't either if i did i would i would change but the um you know i don't need to I, I just don't feel the need to like go after God altogether. And I look at people that I really care about and I see how those beliefs really make them, I, I can see how those beliefs make them really committed to being better people. And, and I respect that. But where I do take issue is this weird area where people will say, God kind of helps. Right. Like, like, look, it, I'm almost like, one or the other on this like okay if you believe god helps in like you want to hedge your bets on that fine but what i see a lot of people do is they go well god sometimes helps and after that it's a mystery and i see a lot of danger in that and what it, what and you know this you knowing me i mean that article the god in sports article which i've got to get done at some point and i'm just sharing all my failures in terms of productivity with everybody but it's really not, it's like, I don't write that about sports. That's a, that article is about faith healing. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's it's just faith healing. It's like, so it's a safe place where people consider this. Oh, God helped my kid get better. Oh yeah. Well, what about that kid? They prayed and died. God has a plan. You know what? That's me. There's, there's not a lot of value in, uh, not a lot of practical significance in, in this theory. So why don't we just not count on God and, and leave it at that? I mean, that's, that's what bothers me about it. I almost have, oh gosh, don't, nobody quote me out of context on this, but you know, I, eh, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Probably for the best. <laughs> well, you know what? No, I'll say it this way. Okay. I, I have a, I have a sympathy for people, even though it makes me really angry. I do have some sort of broad sympathy that People who believe in faith healing all the way to the end are at least consistent. Mm -hmm. The problem is, you know, if they're adults making decisions for themselves, I'd be like, well, I I'm sorry you died, but your your commitment is and your belief in God is at least at least you're principled on the matter. But obviously, when there are children involved and so they're not consenting to these things, I mean, then that's a whole nother. And um, I remember at one point, we uh, a question that I really enjoy asking 
skeptics is their, you know, their pet, their pet issue. Right. And the, the one that really resonates with them. And I, I have always found the faith healing thing fascinating. And I have always found it particularly. I didn't know that. I didn't know that was your hot button. I was thinking of this football, but no. <laughs> No, I know no, what you mean. I, no, no, football is not my hot button. Football is my mercurial button. I, I, <laughs> I love it and I hate it. I'm like, you know, I really don't think high school kids should be paying for this or playing football. I am now going to go to the Broncos game and buy a beer and a hot dog for $800. Yeah, no, football is my, my conflict. You know, it's funny that you say that because if somebody was to ask me, what is my hot button issue? I say it like when you're talking to somebody, at a skeptics meetup or whatever you say okay so what is the thing that you know you're sitting there in the room with all these people and they're talking and what is the point where you cannot you know you've been sitting on your hands the whole time what is the time where you're like oh no you cross the line i have to i have to say something and what is the time that you will finally say I, i'm going to stand up and put my hand up in this uncomfortable situation of all these strangers i don't know mine is prayer and healing and i didn't realize that um that was your topic because that's kind of like the issue that hits me is whenever if people pray fine that's to me i feel like it must be some sort of meditation they're they're regrouping their whatever but when they when they pray to heal especially if they're praying to heal and not do anything else that is my go-to no we're, we're yeah. you can just cross the line with me and i'm gonna have to make myself very uncomfortable and confrontational and tell you no <laughs> no yeah, if only if if thoughts and when children are involved but part of me when children are involved oh yeah it's awful it's just awful and i mean it's it's tough to know what to do with that i mean obviously many 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 religious people um don't you know they in all sorts of faiths they they believe in god's intercession or some supernatural form of intercession but they they still take their kids to the doctor, but yeah, many don't, do. and and adults and children die unnecessarily or get harmed. Or for some people, right, they they really perk up when they go, "Wait, you mean you mean I pay more in taxes because people are doing this?" Oh, you know, now I'm worried. But um, but yeah, whatever whatever floats your boat, it, it's a big problem. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, and then just to answer your question completely, the last. Um, Psychon, where I was so excited because I got to do. You were at the main talk. stage. That um, was a yeah, big deal. The main stage. Although you've heard me say this before, a lot of people bail on those Sunday talks and they are often really, really good. Um, oh, that's why I always go and I always record. And I yeah. put it up on my channel because Psychon doesn't record the Sunday talks for some crazy reason, but I record them and I have them for the last few years on my YouTube channel because I think they're. I think there's some of the best of skepticism, just in a little nutshell, the people who are coming along that are coming up the ladder, I guess, or just at least have interesting ideas and they're tight, really concise. I love them. Hey, did you hear that beep, beep, beep? No. If you did, that's my computer telling me it's windy out. See, I get these blue box warnings over and over again. And now I'm gonna get like probably four more from all the different bases telling me it's windy. Ooh, hail forecast. You know, I should mention too, when you were talking about the titanium um, necklaces, I will be talking to Richard Saunders from Australian Skeptics tomorrow at three. And Richard Saunders is kind of an expert on uh, the placebo bands and, uh, and the, Oh, I had the phrase in my head a second ago, you know, where you're able to bend and it looks like you can bend further the next time, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I'll be talking to him about that tomorrow. So it'll be interesting to mention this talk, which you said there about uh, the test that you did, because he's Richard Saunders and his friends and the Australian skeptics are pretty much the reason we were able to get rid of power balance, which is kind of the same idea. It's a, it's some piece of plastic or string fold at high costs that are supposed to help you balance or help you feel better or more energetic or whatever. But well, a lot of these products, they're hard to debunk because they don't have an easy way to create a control condition. Mm -hmm. And I think by chiropractic medicine, how do you make people feel like they had chiropractic medicine when they didn't? How do you make people feel like they had acupuncture when they didn't? Right. So, um, so you, it's really it's, hard. Yeah, it's hard to undo the placebo, but the titanium necklaces, they just walk right into them. I just, 
you and you didn't I was sitting there the night before taping like 40 of these you know sitting there stringing them out wrapping duct tape around or wrapping masking tape around and then connecting them with a little bit of white duct tape it was it was a pain but worth it so well what i want to know and i think inquiring minds out there probably want to know while you were sitting there wrapping those up how did your hands feel did they <laughs> do were they tired <laughs> That's true. I, I did it all in five minutes. I felt super powered. Yeah, it was great. I was doing algebra on my head. It must have cured any kind of ailment you had. Yeah, one of my kids screamed in my ear and I just turned because I was vital and relaxed. And I said, I, I love you. Let's talk about more appropriate forms of behavior. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And then as soon as I passed them out, I just became cranky and, and <laughs> lackluster and, you know, all that energy drained from you. I would think you would have just put them under your bed. You know, you, you see these people who believe in these kinds of things and you think to yourself, wouldn't hospitals have like beds of titanium if it worked or crystal or whatever it is? Wouldn't they, wouldn't, wouldn't everybody who walked, you know, everybody have a shield of titanium like a gown, the PPE would just be made of titanium lace or so. I mean, these logical, well, if it worked, wouldn't we, wouldn't we do these things, you know? Well, Fighting, by the way, did sell shirts with titanium. Really? Yeah, I'm quite confident in that. And then I believe on their webpage when I was doing the research, they did have titanium lounges that you could go into. And, oh, and well, you go, oh, man, this is crazy stuff. But then, you know, you have Tom Brady's infrared pajamas. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> and there you go, TB12. Which leads into your, your talk, your Sunday talk, uh, not your Sunday talk, your main stage talk at Psycon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that talk was um, this. Uh, <laughs> what I wanted to do was try to examine a broad question of, what role personality plays and what role social factors play in causing people to believe in pseudoscience. And being a social psychologist, you basically get trained in the, there's another blue box, I'm sorry. I can't stop them either. It's a default program. I can't see program. them. Well, it's okay, I'm not seeing it. So. I can't hear it. Oh, good, well, I won't worry about it anymore. But the, as a social psychologist, you're trained to look at not personality, but the situational view. And in truth, we all, we typically kind of go back and forth, but I mean, I graduated with a social psychology degree, so I'm used to thinking about things from a social influence perspective. And one of the gripes I have with understanding pseudoscience is, and this is natural for people, but they so often tend to look at people that believe in it and they go to the, you must be dumb, you must be crazy kind of um, perspective. You must be unintelligent, I should say. And what, they, what they're doing is they're just seeing the end point of where somebody has ended up. Mm -hmm. And my goal with the research was to demonstrate that um, people that believe in pseudoscience aren't by definition, unintelligent, and they're not crazy. Now, use of the term crazy is awkward because if you this unpack it, you go, bad well, word what, what, are you, what are you saying? Like, they're not schizophrenic. Like, they're not, like, literally delusional, which, uh, which is, of course, terribly sad. And I'm not making light of it, but they're not delusional people. I mean, they might be quirky, um, but I don't, what do you mean by crazy? Like, what, what problem do they have specifically? Crazy is just this catch-all for like, where are you coming from on this? And I, I'll be sympathetic. I mean, when you have people that are staunchly anti-vaccination, I mean, you do go, how in the world did you end up here? But those knee-jerk reactions of stupid and crazy, I just think are overplayed. Mm -hmm. So I tried to go and I succeeded with a student. We went to the Bigfoot conference and passed out these surveys and we only had two pages. So basically you have to do a quick hitter. What are the big issues in personality? What are the big social issues? Get everything you can on the paper, a few scientific reasoning items and collect the data and then compare them to people's confidence in Bigfoot and see which variables predict confidence in Bigfoot. And the results we have don't show really any evidence for the personality perspective. 
hmm. right? The Bigfooters, people that really believe in Bigfoot, their self-esteem seems high, their personality seems fairly normal. And, and of course we interact with them. I mean, they're normal people. And I know Ben has a lot of experience with this. I think uh, Ben Radford, who writes a lot, obviously for Skeptical Empire. And I, I'm confident, I won't speak for him. I'm confident he has the same impression. And then we did ask an item and I regret not, um, I didn't put more emphasis on this because I didn't anticipate it. But we did ask, like, when did you start believing in Bigfoot? And I remember reading at least a few people said, well, I got a book when I was like eight. And it's a fascinating because you can imagine this tipping point occurred so early in their life or I was out with my uncle and we saw a Bigfoot, I was 13. And it's probably the moment where, if you imagine that that roof theory, um, that rooftop, that's a nice analogy that I believe Carol Travis um, has spoken about, right? That That's a moment where they just started to go down a different way of interpreting the world than other people do. And, and pulling them up and bringing them back down is, is difficult. Now, the other thing I like about Bigfoot is that Bigfoot's pretty harmless. So I didn't think I would go to this conference and get all worked up about Bigfoot and and I didn't. It was we had a we had a great time. My um, the cadet that was doing the independent study with me, but so it was pretty easy to to do that. I think it would be it would be tougher at a uh, at a anti vaccination proponent conference. And I thought it would be tougher at a flat Earth conference. And I did go to a flat Earth conference here in Denver, and I I made it through the majority of that conference without really getting mad. But there was one time I was. I was really, really mad, and I, had right. to, I yeah, and I had to kind of compose myself because I'm there as a researcher, right? I'm there as a psychologist. I'm not there to go duke it out with people, not literally, of course. Um, I mean, just what I need, you know, globe or professor and flat earth or getting in fact, headline. And the, and headline. The flat are, they're like they're generally nice people, but uh, there was a moment at the conference that was was it was it when they kind of crossed the line into anti-vax. Some of them are, they believe uh, no, it. Was, it wasn't anti-vax. Now remember, like, like I know the flat earth thing and I know the anti-vax thing, pardon me, the anti-vaccination thing. So I know that, um, like before I go to the flat earth conference, people, people would say like, hey, ask them about sunrises. And I realized how much I had learned and I, was, I thought, I'd go, okay, they've heard that. Like I know that's what you want to ask, but they've heard it, and I'll take it one step further. They want you to ask about sunrise. They've got a gotcha. They, they, they're they, gonna they, lay yeah. down the smack, and then they're gonna ask you something you don't know, and then you're gonna go, huh? And they're gonna be like, I won. And like, no, I, I was just there to listen. And uh, so with these different issues, like I was braced. Like I knew what arguments they would come at me with, um, and it was all friendly, by the way. We. Uh, another professor was there, and we had beers with the flat earthers. It it was all it was all fine, and the, the but the moment it wasn't anti vaccination, it was school shootings. And, and what? Was, it was Where did they get that earth. from? Flat Earth. They flat the flat Earth community is it is a it is the most conspiratorial group of people I've ever been around in my life. Oh, and so false flags. There's a lot, yeah. Uh, there was, there's a lot of anti-vaccination there. There's going to be a lot of procreationism, anti-evolution there. But all I was just conversing with this person. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, so you think those school shootings are real? And I was just like, whoa. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, and I wasn't prepared for it. And That'd I was really like, hard. I was just ready to start screaming, like, but I know, and an outsider, I could see somebody going, how do you condone that? And I don't condone it. If I just start yelling at this guy, it's not going to work. Like, uh, it's not that I condone it. It's it's awful. I couldn't disagree with it more. I mean, these poor families, and they're dealing with that on top of everything else. Like, oh my God, it's just, it's, I just, it's awful. But like, if I just start yelling at him, it's not going to do any good. So I just looked at him. I, I mean, I felt all the anger boiling up, and I looked at him, and I just said, I think there's a lot of danger in promoting that kind of view without really substantial evidence and and he let it go at that point he oh <laughs> he probably saw he probably said i think yeah i think so me. i mean yeah <laughs> but, um but it, yeah it was it was an, an interesting experience 
that, so Ben Radford has chimed in and the school shooting, the false flag things really get me, but I don't interact with people like that, but I think that would really be bad. Ben Radford has said, this is why a background in psychology is so helpful in understanding the worldview of believers. When you study all the ways in which they and we, everyone misinterpret, misunderstands and misconceives, misperceives and misremembers, it gives you more sympathy. You're less likely to assume someone is lying or crazy instead of simply wrong, which we all are some of the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely true. What wise person wrote that? Ben Radford. Yeah, and, it's, and so, Rob, it's part of me. Uh, and Rob also said that that's, that's the danger of a movement using quotes. Yeah. Well, it's tough too. The, I mean, in like, you really see it with ghosts, right? How, how do you tell somebody their memory of a ghost is wrong? And yeah, you luckily, <laughs> yeah, luckily the ghost thing's pretty harmless, but, but that inability to say, maybe I was wrong about that is it, it keeps people mired in a, a lot of unreasonable beliefs and with good reason, right? It's, it's, it's disconcerting to say things I remembered from my childhood might not have happened. It's, it's, it, 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 un, it undoes a little bit the foundation of memory that we hold so dear about our life narrative. Mm -hmm. But I think if we want to be genuine, if we're genuinely committed to the truth, then you have to say, um, you have to recognize once you learn them that there are a lot of problems with memory. Thank you, Elizabeth Loftus and all the other people in yes, that area. Definitely. And there's a lot of there's a lot of problems with um, with in, in what is it encoding, storage, and um, oh my gosh, recall. Yeah, I mean those processes screw up. But here's a uh, one place where it can really help you is of course in relationships. And you say, hey, you know that didn't happen that way, and you go. Yeah, maybe it didn't. Maybe I remember it wrong. Get, get you out a lot of trouble. Rob Rob Lee had asked a question. This is uh, mm -hmm. Rob Lee from Vegas. He says, "How many flat earthers got got there from info wars? Info wars, because info wars pushes school shooting false flag theories." I wish I knew. And even it would be. It's a difficult question to answer because. Surveying flat earthers is so tough. That's why I went to the conference. I mean, they represent probably, I don't know, two confident flat earthers, 2% of the population, maybe four in the United States. I, I don't uh, know. I think. I think so. And um, I can name drop here. So Glenn Branch from the uh, National Nation. Center for Science Education and I, we have sifted through some polls that go over these issues. And of course, no poll is perfect. I mean, any any average is just a point estimate for the sample. And then of course there's wording issues with the question, sampling bias and things like that. But if you look at the responses and you have to guess how many people are trolling and that's hard to know. Um, I don't think as many as some people think, but there's some evidence for that. But I, I, on these surveys, it's like probably two to 5%. So and take that for what you will, typically younger people. Uh, the point of this though is like you, you can't just grab like you'd have to s get a sample of 10,000 people just to have like 30 of those people in your sample. So you go to the conference and I wasn't prepared to do a survey because that's difficult to do and I just wanted to observe. If they were watching InfoWars, which is it? Did the Flat Earth lead them to InfoWars or did InfoWars lead them to the Flat Earth? Is it conspiratorial think conspiratorial thinking that leads them to the flat earth or does flat earth necessitate a belief in conspiracies? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I wish I did. It would be fascinating. Well, Brian Hart has his, who's weighed in with a question for you. This is a real important one. Mm -hmm. How many flat earthers can dance on the head of a pin? <laughs> Brian Hart, everyone. Thank you. He'll be here all week. Thank you, Brian. I, I have flat earth friends and uh, yeah, so not, I mean, I don't know. I'm not. I, How many can dance on the head of a pin? I don't, 50? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we have some interesting friends. Pardon me? <laughs> we have some interesting friends. 
Well, agreed. Yeah, I, I um, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, we, I know a couple of flat earthers around here that I've communicated with and uh, I, Can they I, dance? pardon me? <laughs> Can they dance? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't ask them to dance. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, we don't but know. But they can't they can drive a boat on Bubble Reservoir, so I do know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we went down there to test globe versus round earth. Oh. The test was inconclusive. Oh, as usual. Yeah. No, so, Bubble so. Reservoir is really big. So we had a they had a like a post on one end and a post on the other end, and then we we're in the middle in a boat trying to hold the water so see if the sign would be higher than the other signs it was it was a hoot a hoot yeah it was fun <laughs> i'm just laughing at the word hoot so tell me yeah. about uh, facilitated communication so you are leaving colorado springs oh yeah Today is your it. last yep. day and you are moving to syracuse Syracuse, New so York. My school is, of course, in Cortland, but we are living in Syracuse. So please continue. I think I know where you're going with this. The hotbed of facilitated communication. Yes. So Absolutely. this Capital. is going to be fascinating to watch what happens in our. You have had quite a bit to do with facilitated communication in the in the academic side of it. You know, Janice Boyton and I and others have been really active in a group we call True Voices which is kind of to pull together people who are all experts in this, in this area of facilitated communication, rapid prompting method, hand over hand, spelling to type, all these, spelling to communicate, all these other things it's called. Yeah. Oddly, they keep changing the name of it because it's got such a negativity. But you have been involved, um, you've written a, um, one or two articles on, that we've been able to use for Wikipedia that are really, you know, from the academic way of, um, I don't know how to say this, more academically, you know, you're able to give us, look into it. So tell us a little bit about that, especially the DJ. Oh, yeah. Deej. So, Deej. Um, Deej, yeah, he, it, well, he. Tell, is, tell the audience what we're talking about first, because I, I don't think they know what facilitated communication is necessarily. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I don't know. Oh my gosh, get a drink of water, Susan, because I'm going to open up here and it's just going to be <laughs> awesome. Okay, so um, one thing that's really nice about getting into facilitated communication is that in addition to my interest in it being a skeptic, it's also obviously in, at least partially, it's partially in the field of psychology. Now, it's way out of my field. I need to show all the respect to the developmental um, psychologists and the psychologists that study people uh, with learning disabilities. Like, definitely not my area of expertise. But it is the type of thing that in a introduction to psychology class that you would touch on. And so it's kind of related in that way. So what facilitated communication is, is that um, it is a facilitated communication is a method. It's a technique for helping people, um, in theory, helping people communicate. And it is used, as far as I know, exclusively with people who have learning disabilities because, um, and they're typically, they have a learning disability that makes them nonverbal. And so the theory is that inside that person is um, somebody with greater communication skill than they're able to exhibit without facilitating communication. So if you just have somebody hold their hand and uh, there's any way, facilitated communication includes any physical contact. Yeah, thank you. Any physical contact where, where you are helping guide the person. So the theory is, and the theory isn't, um, the theory is, I guess, appealing enough that you could see why so many people bought into it. So the idea is that um, I have a hard time typing on my own. But when this facilitator holds my hand and helps stabilize it, so then I can press the keys, yeah, I can press the keys with, um, with some assistance, then I'm able to communicate better than I can when my facilitator is not there. And of course, this began in Australia with Rosemary Crossley, who, I mean, that's the known history of it. And maybe somebody else did it. And she did this with some people and uh, people, who, uh, children who had learning disabilities and reported these remarkable gains in intelligence and boom, facilitated communications on its way. 
the other big chapter in this is when Douglas Bigelin got involved from when he was at Syracuse. He has since retired recently. Uh, they made him a dean, by the way, I believe, before he retired. Yeah, interesting, right? And he um, he brought this to the United States, and and that helped make it grow. And it's a worldwide phenomenon now. And the reason it appeals is essentially, I mean, they call it the Ouija board phenomenon. And I think that's a, a great example because for people that believe in a Ouija board, right, that ideomotor effect is so subtle, they just can't believe it's that powerful. So when you watch a documentary like the one Deej is in, if you're not familiar with facilitated communication, you go, oh, well, I mean, it, it sure looks for all the world like Deej is, is typing. The problem with facilitated communication is. All right. Oh. <laughs> you woke up my cat. <laughs> Whoa. Whew, I'm glad you're okay. Right outside the door. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the problem with facilitated communication, or I should say, the interesting facet of facilitated communication, talking about control conditions, is it, it's actually pretty easy to test, right? You, so this whole thing blows up. And it's like, oh, look at these facilitators and people are getting into it and they're well-intentioned people. I mean, think about what they do for a living. They, they are people who say, I want to do this job. This job that I'm assuming is never gonna make you really wealthy. And they do it because they care about people with learning disabilities. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I mean that genuinely. Yeah. But then somebody steps in and says, okay, if all of this is true, then we should be able to put a screen between you and the person with learning disabilities and show me, show me that you can still do it. And like, there's the evidence is terrible. Like, there's not even, like, there's, I can't think of any single pair of facilitator and person who, who demonstrates that they can do this, that they can communicate at a level with facilitated communication where the facilitator is blinded to the information better than they can otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us that know it, there were a couple of documentaries. The really big one is the Frontline documentary. I remember being introduced to the Frontline documentary and you go, well, they got them, it's over. And yeah, you think. And it never died. And it's, it's still going strong and Syracuse is still the leader in it. My move to Syracuse is, is coincidental, but I sure, do. Craig. I do. <laughs> yeah, it's like when Hercule Pro Row shows up at a, some place and you're like, are you here for a case? Are you no, no, I'm just here for a vacation. Sure you are. And then there's a murder. Murder. Yeah, yeah. Not her no Aunt Lansbury. Lansbury. Yeah, yeah. She was strangely, she was strangely <laughs> I wouldn't want her around me. I'm, no, I'm just saying no, she didn't come no. to my town. I'm I'm yeah. going on vacation when she comes to visit. Yeah, and Matlock, man, I mean, who wants to live in that town? <laughs> it's just a war zone. <laughs> so Craig Foster goes to Syracuse. Uh-huh. Yep. Well, and now I'm, I'm going to get, I, I'm happy to share this. So I have to be really, really careful with this because I'm joining a new department and I have to see how that department goes and we all have to get along. And um, uh, so I don't, I don't want to go in and, and even before I'm getting there, be too pushy. But I, I do have in my mind, if it fits into our overall curriculum, I, I have long wanted to develop a class. I initially wanted to call it something like the psychology of pseudoscience, but I'm now inclined to see if I can create a class called science-based activism. So that is on my mind. And Even then um, we might visit Syracuse. Um, we, would, we would be, I think, I would plan to be transparent about our visit, but we might visit Syracuse and, and share our feelings about <laughs> the facilitated communication as a, as a lesson to people in activism. But that's way down the road. I have to, I have to start my job and yeah, and, uh, you got to get there first, unpack. Have to get there, and there are a lot of things that I will be doing before I can think about when to possibly explore a class. But it's exciting. It is exciting. A whole new yeah. life that's kind of coming up. You know, get the kids registered for school and make new friends. Yep. And yep, yep. Protesting the <laughs> ICI and yeah. So, by the way, when we were up there uh, house hunting, it was right when, um, unfortunately, COVID was starting to really ramp up. Oh. And we went, we went by the building. I, I had to promise uh, my wife, Jennifer, I'm like, look, I'm, I just want to see it. You know, I'm not going to ask any questions and, and I can, I can be patient, but, um, but we went by the building. It was all locked up. 
So yeah, so then we bought donuts and had coffee. And <laughs> I've been to, I gave a talk to the Syracuse skeptics for their 15th anniversary about awesome. three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I stayed uh, with the leader of the skeptics group in her home with her husband. And um, I remember going for a walk, which was just a few blocks down from the Syracuse University. And I'm walking around the campus going, where is it? Where is it? It's kind of a nice campus, you know? I don't think yeah, I can it is nice. there. Yeah. It's, that humidity is just, oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm dreading that. I'm not used to heat or weather yeah. at all. It's mild where I live. It's all year round mild. Once in a while we have a little bit of, little bit of cold, but it's not, I, I'm a weather wimp. That's, that's what I call myself. I can't handle anything. But yeah, Syracuse was a nice town. I mean, we went in and watched, uh, um, went to one of the museums on the, the canals. Mm -hmm. They had a lock, they had a canal there, and that ran through uh, Syracuse and all that area, and it would get into Ohio, and that's how all the goods came, and a lot of immigrants came in from that way. Really interesting. I, 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 I really liked Syracuse. I thought it was great. Yeah, well, we're hoping we'll like it, too. Well, I'm sure you will. You can't, it, it's, it's, you know. It's fun. And you're going to be well, close yeah. to uh, Center for Inquiry up there in, in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'll have to pay them a visit too. That'll be fun. So tell mm -hmm. me about, uh, you know, one of the things we really miss and people have been uh, posting on the Facebook feed and I got a private message from somebody who was telling me that they, that, you know, how much they miss PsyCon and uh, the interaction. And I think the second time you came, the first time you came to PsyCon, you know, I've been going to conferences for years and, and the Vegas ones are always my favorites because they're, um, you're in a casino, everybody's there together. You, 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 you uh, get your hotel room in the casino, all your meals are in the casino, pretty much, you know, or within walking distance around there. And then with social media, of course, we can keep in touch with people like, where are you? I'm over here. Come join us over here. We're going to have a drink over here. Let's get dinner over there. It's fun. So you're with these giant groups of people and you just kind of go from place to place and have a great time. I'm missing already. And it wasn't, it wasn't going to be until October. I'm already missing it. I am missing it too. So um, I don't know, growing up, growing up the way I did and thinking the way I do, when I went to my first PsyCon, I was like, oh my gosh, this is my church. <laughs> <laughs> You're with your I people. I so at home here. Uh, and for other people, it's obviously, you come to learn it's different, right? Uh, uh, going to PsyCon or a different skeptics conference is, a process of them putting a toe in the water and then sticking in a little farther. And um, um, I guess I know maybe a couple people who might be um, making comments. They just jumped in the pool. They're like, I'm not sure about where I am. I'm just going to jump in the pool altogether. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I, I really enjoy going and learning about new things related to skepticism. And the Las Vegas thing is great. And I would add to it, if, the conference organizers change this. I, I would understand the argument against it. But one thing they do that I really like is there's only one talk at a time. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you, I mean, obviously some people don't go to every talk and nor do they have to. Or but <laughs> it, it, <laughs> They come hang out with me in the lobby. But it allows people to say, you have this shared experience. They go to a talk and then they might go get lunch and they go, what do you think of the talk? And uh, so I think it makes it a bit more um, familial, if you will. And I, um, I had a really easy introduction to the community because um, you were so kind and you know, <laughs> people. And, uh, and that's, that's how I want it to be. So uh, yeah, it, it's, I'm, I'm going to miss soon. Yeah, it's, it's I'd say that like I'm doing anything. Like we'll, well get another one going soon. I'm meaning I'll I'll sit in my house at Syracuse and look for emails about it. Oh, it's it, you know the thing about it is and I've been doing these for a long time. My son Sterling was just telling me he says, oh, "We're not going to Vegas this year. This is the first time in 14 years we have not gone to a conference in Vegas." And that's I I'm, I'm not really a big huge fan of Vegas, but um you know it, it's it's odd. And so 
I've learned over the years how to do these conferences if you're a social person or if you want to become more social. And what I always tell people is to arrive early and stay late. And I suggest that to anybody who will listen to me. And most people who have followed my advice tell me how much they enjoyed the conference because what people who are new to conference attendance, the, one of the big mistakes they make is they treat it as if it's an academic conference where you show up, you know, you bring your spouse like it's Vegas and they go off gambling or go watch shows all day. And then you go to the lectures and then you meet up with your spouse and then you go off and do other things that are have nothing to do with the conference. And PsyCon, and I'm getting a couple thumbs up from somebody over here. PsyCon, and like in New Zealand and also the conferences in, in um, QED and in um, Australia, the other conferences, which I absolutely adore too. Please invite me back when COVID's over, <laughs> when we're free to come back. But you go, and arrive a day early or so and just hook up with whoever's there. And I mean, hook up in the nicest sense of you go hang out with them and you have yeah. food and whatever, whatever happens. But the happens. other, the other isn't forbidden, but that isn't what, uh, it's what, not what I was talking at. about. Yeah. That's not me. So you go and you, 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 you know, there's a thing about, don't laugh. there's a thing about just sitting and hanging out with people and just sitting at a table and having a coffee or whatever you, you know, your drink of beverage of choice and just shooting the breeze. That's what my dad would say. And you would just, hang out with them and then you go to the conferences with the mindset of knowing that there's all these people there who do not know anybody else so you turn and you look at the person who's sitting next to you in the lecture and maybe you make a comment or two about you know the lecture and what you heard and then when the break happens you kind of mingle off together and you say let's go to lunch you know and you just go and in my world in the Susan Gerbic world anybody who's got a name tag on you know who's at the conference you're welcome. Come on, hang out. There's always another seat at my table. And maybe we have to start another table with other people, you know, because there's too many people. But in, I really love the fact that we're all intermingling with each other, different, different worldviews, different cultures, who knows what they, what they think, you know, and, and all opinions are okay. Just, you know, well, most of them. But let's, let's have it, you know. I mean, we shouldn't find anybody in there who's, who believes in false flags or anti-vax. I mean, that shouldn't be something that's normally would attend a conference. But you, you just, the conference continues all day and into the evening. And you get up and, and you go to breakfast with people. And then you go to the conference together and then you have lunch together. And sometimes it's different people. Sometimes it's the same people. And it just goes through until you, you're sleep deprived <laughs> by the end of the conference. And I always tell everybody, stay till the following Sunday. I mean, the following, the Monday after the conference, because Sunday you've got paper talks and they usually have a talk after that. And then you go hang out with people at lunch, I mean, and dinner and, and then, then, Monday morning you have breakfast and you you're usually exhausted but you hang out with everybody again and you just talk and it just it's a community it really is yeah. and I think I totally agree yeah. yeah you know it's a feeling of you found your people and so I tell people you know if you're going to come with your spouse or whatever bring them to the conference too because you're not going to really have time to go see a show with your spouse and not hang out with other people you're going to want to be with the people you've met i mean you kind of got to break out of your shell a little bit and i am getting a people i am getting some people giving thumbs up to to what i'm saying and uh adrian hill she says and you might get called up on stage by banachek <laughs> <laughs> and rob True. is saying that he went to the top of the eiffel tower with people or the big wheel in vegas and that's true especially if you arrive a little early Mm -hmm. will, you'll find people on the PsyCon Facebook group. So if you're going to go to PsyCon, uh, go to the Facebook group for PsyCon. There is, a, there is an actual Facebook thread and people will post on there saying they're looking for roommates or they're going to arrive at a certain day at a certain time. You know, does anybody want to share a taxi? Um, that's the best way of getting to know people. And then you just kind of meet at the airport and you go over together and then you have lunch and hang out. and. Um, somebody says i want to see pin and teller who else wants to go to pin and teller i'll get the tickets everybody just pay me back and we all go to pin and teller or or um or uh what we what we did um 
with Mark Edward and I and Ben Radford and some others at one of the TAMs, we went to go see a psychic and protested Sylvia Brown. That was so much fun. That had been, that was totally had nothing to do with TAM. It just happened to be that there was, Sylvia Brown was at a different uh, casino down at the, at the end of the, end of the strip and we went and protested. Sure, that was sure so it had nothing to do. Now it's your turn. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, we want to go, you know, I really fully expected to go and see Thomas John, who's one of my latest uh, psychic that I follow. He has a show in, in uh, Caesars right now. But of course he didn't predict us and it's canceled because of COVID. But <laughs> he didn't, he didn't notice, uh, you know, that he went ahead and said, oh, it's been yeah. a minor thing. Yeah. It's a minor thing. I didn't, I didn't say anything. I didn't mention it. In fact, I was selling tickets for dates that it's canceled now. So I don't know if his show is going to come back or not. We'll see. But um, I was really excited if he was to make it to October, which I was kind of shocked if he would make it to October because his numbers were already declining and it was always already a problem. And uh, um, if he had made it to October, when Psycom was there, we were going to go and we were going to go in a big way. It was going to be a blast. But one of the things he did is he didn't have tickets for October. And I think he planned a cruise. He was going on a cruise to somewhere right. and he was taking people. I fully believe that the reason why he booked the cruise at that time was because he knew that it was going to be a community of skeptics in town and that I and Mark Edward and others and the Las Vegas skeptics were going to be there. Well, and that would that would have been a hot read, right? Where he's like, let's see what's going on in the calendar. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> shit. I better get out of here. <laughs> I better get out of here for reals. And I, I kind of thought, you know, I really would have liked to go and see him and had everybody go. That would have been fun if we bought out the whole theater. <laughs> All yeah. of us. I think it's only 190 people can fit in that room, so. You know, you get 700 people, 1,000 people are going to PsyCon. I'm sure we could get 50 people to buy tickets or something. That would have been <laughs> that been hilarious. Nope, you're wrong. Nope, you're wrong. Nope. Could you nope. be more specific? Yeah. yeah. You That's know, a pretty general name. Facebook. Yeah. Why did, you, why did you just read what I put on Facebook? That's, I just posted obituary for, for my dad on Facebook. Can you tell me a little bit more? Something that isn't on my Facebook page? I mean. Absolutely. That would have been hilarious. But. It's so been I, hard uh, COVID stuff. Pardon me? The COVID just kind of has ruined all my plans. Yeah. It's and real the too. Look at I have a cat stretching. Isn't that great? Everybody's going, wow, that is so adorable. I wish I had our cat, but he's at home. I don't bring him to work. So that, going to come. What's that? I don't think mm -hmm. my cat's with I keep asking him to go for a ride with me. I, I was going to put a basket on my bicycle and, and ride around and get my exercise and put the cat in there but they don't want to go that's, that's too bad it's not in their nature they can see the neighborhood yeah so when my first psycon um i remember and i did so i too had uh, more of a um, to me a conference i had more of a schema for an academic conference so i get there and i'm like okay well i better go down to the desk and, and pick up my registration packet and boom and the first person I see is James Randi talking to some people. And I remember distinctly thinking, I was like, oh my God, it's James Randi. And then I realized I was going fanboy on James Randi. Like it would be like somebody else seeing Bruce Springsteen. And I was, I, I was like, it's over. I am a total nerd. Like, <laughs> it, I just, yeah. But I do, I would agree with you with the social thing. It, it's so true. I think if, um, if I had a family member go, and I say family member because my daughter is getting interested, like she wants to go. And I, I told her, I'm like, these are all day talks. And she's like, it's fine, bring it on. I'm like, okay, you're, really? you're 11. Right. I'm, I'm not sure you're, How you're ready to sit through all day, but- um, How old is she? She's 11, about to turn 12. Um, and and, and was, I told and you before, dad, Sterling's first- I told, I've told you before, my son Sterling, his first conference, he was 14 and yeah. he's gone to everyone since. So it's yeah. possible. Yep. Yep. So we'll see. But um, being skeptics are, I mean, we're, we're a subsample of the population. If, if we weren't, the news would be very, very different than it is. Oh yeah. And it's, it's just, I really like being around people that 
are united by, hey, this seems ridiculous. Why do we, why do people believe in this? And then as an outgrowth of that, sometimes just want to talk about science and knowing stuff. And it, it's good. I mean, I, I love it. I love having a community of people. And, um, and it didn't take long. It was that first icon and, and I was on my way. And now I have people on Facebook and all the usual stuff. Oh, and I wanted to show you this. This I almost forgot. So um, I, full transparency, I kept just this little, this little segment. Everything else is, is empty. Empty. Uh, you get trigger warning if you get motion sick. Everything else is, is empty. Can you but show us your view? At, show us your view. Oh, I, I pulled down. Oh, you pulled the blinds. Yeah, that's my, my view. Oh, no, we can uh, see it. Look okay, at the view yeah. from his office that he's leaving you guys. And so um, those. Mountain way down there, and you wouldn't be able to see the towers on it. That's and it has a little towers on it. But I did want to show you this. So I was looking through the elements. Your volume's going funny on you now, Craig, for some reason. What's that? Your volume was going weird. Oh, I'm sorry. I was speaking the wrong direction. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I, I had I left this in my office. For a long time and it was probably a school assignment it's my daughter and it says dear honored sir good luck for your next paper i hope it gets accepted i love you i it's been smudged a little bit uh, i miss you so much good luck with your talk i hope it goes well have fun in las vegas so she gave this to me oh. apparently right before I went to some PsyCon. Oh, yeah. I love your daughter. <laughs> she's very sweet. I'm very proud of her. And oh, she she's had very, a yeah, I don't know where that came from. But uh, oh, this I think is supposed to be this is the quill. So it's this old timey kind of writing. Okay. And it says, sincerely, your dutiful daughter, Langley. Oh, I think we all love your daughter Langley. now. Yeah, I'm in a prison in Monte Cristo, and I'm going to exact revenge on all my enemies. Anyway, that yep. is really sweet. Yep, she's uh, yeah, they're both sweet. So I'm lucky. Lucky man. Yep. Well, what else is on your mind, Susan? Well, we're having a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun doing these talks. It's it's a it it's supposed to be. About Time Presents, in conversation with people or having them do presentations. It's really me getting a chance to catch up with my friends. <laughs> I love it. Well, and I'm grateful for a chance to catch up with you. I have some really interesting, really fun, great, amazing friends. And I'm really glad that we have, we have, we've met. In, and even if it is in the weirdest way of, I wrote to you saying, hey, by the way, I let you, I let you know um, that you're on a Wikipedia page now. <laughs> I thought it was awesome. You know, I, I feel like we need to let, in activism, and this whole world that we're involved in, we don't, you know, we hear from people all the time saying, good job, good job, thanks, you're doing, you know, you're doing great work and stuff like that. But it, it's, it's really hard. And anybody who does activism knows that you don't see the results a lot of the time of what you've, um, you know, what you're trying to do. And it feels really frustrating when, you know, I write these articles or do these stings on these psychics and I got them. I mean, I've caught them. I've explained how they're doing everything. It's so, how can they continue to get TV shows? And it's, it's, you know, here's this Thomas John guy. I caught him and, you know, he, yeah, he already had seatbelt psychic and, and then I caught him, called him out on the New York Times magazine, you know, a million views or something like that. And then he gets a show in Vegas. And then I'm, I'm calling him out again. I'm calling him out again. I'm calling him out again. It's getting on his Wikipedia page where other people can find it. You would think the media would find it and the, uh, you know, the executives and so on. And then he gets another show. He has another show on CBS All Access, the Thomas John Experience, doing the same old schlick that I've already exposed. You know, he's, he's doing this drive share where you get in a car with him and he reads your dead people as he drives away to your destination. Yet he 
isn't in a ride share. He at no time gets directions from you to where you're going. You know, you <laughs> there, there are people that they already know who's going to be in the backseat of that car and they've already been able to hot read them. I mean, on the final credits of the show, it says casting, casting department, casting this, casting that. They've got like six or seven people working in casting for a TV show with zero cast. So, I mean, that should be just obvious, but you know, Craig, it's just so frustrating because we, we, we do this and yet people still believe and they still, I don't, but, but today, right before I got on the call with you, just before I got on a call, I got an email from a woman who said that she had a reading from Thomas John and it was, uh, I guess he'd read for her live. And then he did a private reading for her. And it was so awful that she tried to get um, her money back for, from them. And they just gave her the ring around, you know, just constantly. She says, their office is so disorganized. There's no way I can get a refund. So I managed to fight it with my credit, uh, my uh, credit card. And I got my money back. And she says, and I want you to have the reading. Do you want the audio? I'm like, oh yeah. She goes, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. And I'm like, oh, I see another article <laughs> coming out. <laughs> Awesome. But it's it's like so once in a while you get you know you feel like why can't why can't we get a why can't we get one psychic you know crossed off the list of all these psychics you know it's a whack-a-mole and they keep getting rewarded with more shows and they keep rewarded with more tv appearances and then you get this email out of the blue and you think i guess it's worth it you know it's it's a frustrating kind of thing well, I, I agree. So what you're referring to some, I can't remember who coined this term, uh, but it's chronic malignancy. So Ooh, you, I like you that. Get, I yeah, it's, it um, Wikipedia it's page, nice chronic term. malignancy. Okay. Yeah, so Scott Lillienfeld refers to it in an article Love that he that wrote about facilitated communication. He's great. That too is a chronic malignancy. But we don't, yeah, we all dream of a utopia where you can stamp out nonsense. Or at the very least, get people to go say something more reasonable, like, I guess psychics are possible, but it, there's not a lot of evidence for it. But we shouldn't confuse failing to reach that utopia with not doing any good. And I can give an example with facilitated communication. So I was writing about FC, and I said, look, the turning point for FC I was writing about confirmation bias, and I don't like the confirmation bias accusation because it's too broad and vague, right? Like you're using confirmation bias. So yeah, no, you're using confirmation <laughs> bias, Glover, you? right? So you? you grew up in a Glover world. But I said, but look at it, if you look at it from a group perspective, the big turning point for facilitated communication was arguably 1993. I mean, you could pick any turning point. There's no reason to ask me 1993. But 1993 was the frontline documentary, 1993 was like three big papers about facilitated communication being the focus. And if you look at it from a uh, perspective with the confirmation bias, you'd say, what if that turning point had been earlier? Well, if it had been earlier, maybe the FC movement wouldn't be as strong as it is today. But conversely, if that turning point had been two years later, then maybe we'd be in worse shape than we're in now. Now, we'll never know. Mm -hmm. But it just goes to show that those, those different efforts skeptics make to check the um, paranormal movements, uh, or I'll be even more specific, people promoting things that are unreasonable and dangerous just because they don't succeed at the level we'd all dream of in our skeptical utopia doesn't mean that they don't do any good. And the other thing I will add, and I, I knew I wanted to share this, but the, I think a big turning point is, and it, it was brought up in the comments, humans need to realize that we are imperfect as a species when it comes to processing information. Uh, I'll give us, if people need it, I'll say, look, we're really good. You know, I can get in a plane and fly across the country. That's pretty cool. I mean, I don't, I don't see... Uh, I don't see a clan of sea otters doing that, but the, uh, but I had a visual, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
the uh, but the My daughter is on a plane. That, we, yeah, we good. we have to we have to realize that we make mistakes. So I've got to warn you, I do need to actually out process and turn in my paperwork and turn in my I think yeah this is probably a good time to stop because we've almost been spoke, speaking for two hours and I think we could if if we didn't have a reason to to get up and leave <laughs> we keep probably, going we I would going. and then people would see the link and they'd be like three hours dear wow. god I'm not doing this and they're, and they're watching they're watching Adrian she had a little comment she says my son thinks the best thing we can do to combat pseudoscience is editing Wikipedia I agree and Brian Hart had to say, I don't think the viewers, I'm gonna read it in his voice. I don't think the viewers are likely to read Wikipedia. <laughs> I can say that because Brian Hart's a very good friend of mine. And they do, they do read Wikipedia. They might not go there to necessarily go to the Wikipedia page to say, I wanna know if this guy's a fraud or not. What they do is they go to the Wikipedia page because they wanna know how old they are, um, or they just do a Google search. That's the first thing that comes up as a Wikipedia link and they just fall there by accident. And of course, if you've got something in there that's criticism or, um, you know, something that's like a whole category called Operation Pizza Roll, I think they're likely to look at that and read it and go, wait a minute, what's this Operation Pizza Roll thing? Oh, he was doing, he was caught reading a uh, fake Facebook pages? Well, not my psychic, but you know, kind of does make sense because when he did the reading for me, he did kind of give me a lot of specifics around my Facebook page. It makes them think. So I think people do go to Wikipedia pages. Well, we do that. We do know viewers do because anytime you can watch like uh, Tyler Henry, the Hollywood medium, or anybody who's in the media's eye, you we can see the Wikipedia stats and they just go along and then it spikes on the day that they have a show and then it goes and then it spikes again on another day so we know that people are watching the show and then going to do a google search or whatever and finding the wikipedia page we absolutely know that people are going there and, and at least clicking on it whether they're reading it all the way through we don't know but we do know that they are getting some content off it they're at least going there and that's the best we can do you know we have to fight somehow. And if you can't edit Wikipedia, they could be maybe people like you who are working in the classrooms with people one on one and bringing them to PsychCon. That was really nice that you brought one of your students to PsychCon. That was she awesome. She had a great time. She I, loved I, it. She I, wants I, to go back. Oh, I hope she can, but she's in the academy. Isn't she out of the academy now? And maybe she can't get away. She is out of the academy and um, she will be putting her own bill, most likely, if she goes, but she'll try. Uh, that's wonderful. And now she's got this really great mentor of yours. You showed her the way and maybe she'll be able to do, you know, something I'll come across in the future and she'll say, wait a minute, <laughs> titanium necklaces. Um, you're, you're not suggesting the military has invested in anything paranormal or pseudoscientific over the years. That's a whole other topic. That, that's crazy talk. Of course. For the, record, for the record, I find that very hard to believe on my last day. <laughs> That's just not possible. Oh, I know, I know. So any last thoughts, anything else to last before we go? Um, oh, we've been talking uh, about I, I love catching up with you and to anybody out there that's watching. Love y'all. Keep I'll the skepticism put, going. I'll put your links to your talks that I have in the show notes for the uh, YouTube video. Everybody should just check them out. Bomb detectors, Rob had to just sneak in there. The military would never use bomb detectors that had no, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I've been here too long. I mean, the, the military and civilian people that I work with, they are, um, they are, they have been by and large, a wonderful, wonderful group of people. And I'm sad to leave them. But to think that they have been immune to um, the failures of critical thinking and the, the uh, susceptibility that people have for believing in nonsense, yeah, they are not. And we are all, all ourselves. I mean, I was just talking to somebody this morning from the UK, and we were talking about belief. And most of the people in this community have, have been in the world of pseudoscience. I myself have believed in many pseudosciences in the past when I was growing up. I didn't feel yeah. like I had any, it, it never dawned on me not to. I mean, of course ghosts exist. Of course Bigfoot exists. I mean, it's on TV, of course. Yep. You know? yep. And so 
it is very possible for people to find their way out of these belief structures. Once they finally start to challenge it for themselves, I think that it's really important that we don't belittle people and, um, you know, tell them they're stupid or anything like that, because they just circle the cognitive dissidents wagons and, and they, um, you know, they won't look any further, but if they can kind of reason themselves out of it a little bit, they can save face and they did the research and they figured it out. And, oh, I, now I no longer believe in X, Y, Z because I figure I'm smart. They can't pull the wool over my eyes forever. You know, you have to let yeah, them. They'll, they'll ask when they're ready. I mean, that's what you, and so like, um, I, I had a moment with a person who believes in the flat earth and, uh, you know, you just wait, and then you, you can't go in there guns a blazing, right? You you just wait, and they'll. Um, I mean, you could challenge things, of course. I'm not saying a bit. don't stand up for what you want, but just be realistic about where they where they are. And the thing that aggravates me that skeptics do is don't antagonize unnecessarily. You will antagonize enough when you say, "Have you thought about?" how vague that question was that that psychic asked, right? You're already antagonizing right. enough. Don't go, have you thought about that you're a dumbass for believing that, right? There's there's a way, skeptics should think about, uh, now I'm being directive, I'm sorry, but what bothers me is, what's your purpose? And most skeptics will say, well, my purpose is to make a world where we have less nonsense and better science education. And I'll say, look, we're all emotional and we all make mistakes, but when you write that, Facebook comment that's like you're an effing dumbass. Like mm -hmm. I, you're not you're not succeeding in your broader goal. Absolutely. Yeah. When you're talking to your family and friends about these kinds of beliefs or people you're interacting with them, you want to what you're trying to do is build a conversation with them. You're trying to make it so that you can challenge to you know whatever comfort level you can challenge, put that in their mind, and then when they start having questions they will come to you and say, you know, Craig, what do you think of this? And they're more likely to come to you because they know you're not gonna say you're a dumbass. <laughs> they know Absolutely that you're gonna think true. them as a reasonable person and they'll come to you and say, well, I mean, I had a sister, She's, she died now, but I, I wasn't raised with her, but I remember I was at her home in Ohio and she was watching TV and they had these psychics on you know, and their people were calling in the infomercials and they're saying, hey, I had this reading from so-and-so and she was fantastic and blah, blah, blah. And this is way before I was interested in psychics. And she looked at me, she says, wow, they must be really accurate. I said, or they're actors. And she said, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And I said, yeah. well, maybe they were just told what to say and they're acting and somebody's paying them to, to say those things. She goes, oh, I really hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Well, yeah. lots of people haven't even thought of that. It didn't dawn on them. Anyway, we should get going. It's been really great talking to you. I already miss you. Yeah, same here. <laughs> oh, same here. My cat. When the cat leaves, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that. Nice apartment cat where the cat was sitting. <laughs> so say hello to your children and your wife for me, even though I haven't It'll met do. them. But someday I will eventually, and I hopefully will talk to you again when you get settled in and. Yes. Will do. I'll, I'll drop you a note. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.